Welcome to another episode from the Ed Ed, and today I'm going to be working on my Westinghouse Areola Radio. This guy was probably made in 1922. He started making these guys about December of 1921, and I think they went till like 1923. Uh, the early years, um, they were uh, labeled strictly as you know, Westinghouse and, and sold by Westinghouse, and then the latter years or time, uh, they were sold through uh, R -E RCA, so they would have had RCA on there, made for RCA uh, by Westinghouse. And the early models were a wooden top like this guy, so it kind of dates it pretty nicely, along with the, the label here. The later ones had a, a Bakelite top. And this is basically your first, you know, consumer electronics, basically. Um, before that, you could have bought a radio, um, a little more complicated device. You could have gotten something actually before World War One, technically, but they were really meant for the amateur radio uh, hobbyists and uh, people that could uh, maybe be a little more uh, inclined to deal with the technicalities of how to operate a radio. The earliest ones are really difficult to operate. And this radio, it still has a lot of stuff to twiddle and a lot of stuff to hook up, but compared to uh, other stuff previous to this guy, this is uh, much more manageable and much more likely to be uh, a successful uh, a radio that uh, the average you know, consumer that simply wants a radio might actually be able to get something out of. The problem with this guy, of course, is being it's a really early design, it also had a really early uh, vacuum tube, uh, the WD-11 by Westinghouse. And unfortunately, they only made those for a really scant number of years and they're almost completely unobtainable now and the biggest problem with them was they um, were kind of a weak design that the filament if it burned out it could flop over onto your plate or onto your grid uh, screen and 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 you know, cause a disaster possibly so I also had to find out if any damages occurred to this guy because when I got this guy of course it was missing its tube and so the conundrum is what to do for a, a tube for this guy. There were, um, if you look at uh, on the internet, there's probably about a dozen potential uh, alternatives for, uh, you know, making up a kind of adapters and so forth that'll, that'll make a tube that will work reasonably competitively, comparatively, uh, compatibly, I should say, to a um, uh, the Westinghouse W11. And the one I've chosen to try and do is this little super miniature tube, the 5676. And the idea is I'm going to come up with a uh, kind of a little mock-up shell that will sit in. Uh, basically, this is ABS printed plastic. It's a high temperature plastic, so the heat from this tube probably won't bother it. A copper tubing and a cap. And basically, put it all together with this guy in it, along with some resistors and so forth some brass tubing to act as the, the pins and you know I'm hoping that if I spray paint this silver it'll look kind of like a silvered uh, envelope of a uh, you know glass envelope of a later vacuum tube um, it probably won't be super convincing but it'll be better than just this oddball looking little miniature tube sitting on there these little tubes by the way are kind of interesting they they only have about a hundred hours of filament life and I think they were originally were designed for um, really early hearing aids, and uh, so they obviously had to be going to miniaturize. And the trade-off was is that they had very little short uh, lifespans, only about like a hundred hours on the filaments, which is no big deal for this guy, because you know I'll probably run this thing what maybe uh, a few dozen hours showing them to other people and so forth, and that'll probably be about it. So I'm thinking this will work very nicely. The other advantage to these guys is they're pretty cheap. You can get these pretty easily on the internet, and I'll I'll leave a link to. Uh, the fellow I bought these from, uh, Scott's um, Crystal Radios, he uh, he bought a, a bunch probably for his own um, uh, Areola radio project. Also, I'll, I'll give a link to his uh, project because he gives a really nice write-up on it on his web uh, site. Uh, and these are only like $3 a piece, so not too bad, you know. The, some of these other alternatives of about the dozen or so candidates, some of them are very, very expensive. And... Uh, Hard, almost as hard to obtain tubes, really. So with this, it's cheap. You know, if it doesn't pan out or burns out or what have you, um, not too big a deal, not a whole lot. It's a bit more work just to make it look a little bit more convincing tube. 
Some of the other ones might have looked a little more convincing because they were a vacuum tube, full-size vacuum tube. So anyway, that's like the next thing to do is fit this guy all up and uh, give it a try and get to see what's going on with my aerial uh, radio. Hopefully it's in good shape. Like I say, these guys are so simple. Uh, I think the odds are pretty good that it'll work. I, I do want to open it up and have a look at it. I've been always, I've been, I've owned this thing for my, a couple of years now. I've been holding off tr to do this until I could figure this all out and get to this project. And uh, really want to see the inside of this guy because it's such an early technology and it's really fascinating to me. So get on with this project and see what we can do with it. So working on the uh, delicates of this guy next and the hassle is these uh, tubes are, are very short little um, you know, wired on them and they're very delicate they'll break very easily. Uh, Scott at uh, Scott's Crystal Radio is very uh, very clear on that. that if you bend, bend these any they'll break and uh, luckily he sent me an extra tube and it was, and the tube itself was indeed broken, so I've been using it as kind of a, a learning curve here. And I went to try and sand a little bit off, and immediately one of these uh, pins broke right off. So, it's been a very careful case of sanding very gently, the lightest sandpaper, a little bit heavier grade sandpaper, and then maybe a little bit of green cloth. And then what I've done in practicing, I've taken, uh, I got some nice little forceps here. And I very carefully clamped them across to all of them, just a, just a little bit further away from the glass, to support them. I can do that a little bit more carefully there. And then, you know, bent these guys out. So I plan to do that with the actual, the actual part. Hopefully, I got that on camera. And basically, I tried to bend them without bending them right at the glass because if you bend them right at the glass it's guaranteed they'll snap and you know it's fine wire uh, it apparently is brittle from uh, however it's manufactured maybe corrosion and so forth they do seem to corrode quite a bit so there's quite a bit of corrosion on there so the uh, the big thing is you got to definitely sand these things very very finely to get that corrosion off otherwise you'll never be able to um, get the solder to stick on and then very carefully bend them with uh, you know, some way of making certain the forces do not occur right at the glass. Um, get it a little further away with some finest tools you got. And if you happen to have a dead one, that's kind of handy to practice with. Luckily they're only $3 a piece, if you can get them on the internet still by the time you see this video. Hopefully they can. I, I think they made these by the tons and I've seen quite a few different sites. I'm not sure if Scott will have any uh, by the time this video is on. And, possibly been playing for years, but uh, um, for sure, almost certainly you'll be able to find them somewhere on the internet, um, on eBay, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So the next thing now is, I've, I've drilled really tiny holes and soldered these guys in so that I can press them into the part with the tapered end starting. I, I could have soldered maybe from this side, but then I could have stressed the wire, so by putting it in there it's a better mechanical uh, connection and so forth. So I'll press these guys in, and then the next thing i got to figure out is uh, um, these tubes, of course, don't quite truly match the WD-11, so in order to have control of your rheostat and so forth, I'll probably have to put in a a little bit of a a, a resistor, or possibly two, a voltage dropper, or maybe a shunt or something like that, and still puzzling over exactly how I'm going to do that. So the other reason for doing this wire rather than uh, uh, soldering any components directly to it is that it'll keep this uh, tube from melting the plastic. So I'm hoping that any further soldering I do will not transfer into this tube and melt my... I mean, it's higher temperature plastic, this ABS, but it might still melt at these higher temperatures, so... Anyhow, let's fuss with this some more. Okay, so that's about as good as I'm going to get on uh, on this guy. I got them all pressed in. Um, I think it's a fairly decent height out. It's kind of a problem. I can't figure out exactly what the distances are supposed to be just looking at various pictures. It looks to be about like the pins are about almost as long as it, sticking out as is the base, maybe slightly less. This is about three quarters of that. So I think it's pretty close. So now I gotta bend all these wires up and solder the the um this guy on after very carefully sanding these guys and getting those wires on and I gotta figure out my resistor. 
Okay, so now I got to think about um, how to wire this guy up. There's like, I guess, basically three possibilities. I I could just simply wire it straight up without any sort of compensating resistors, and just not turn the bond control the way and you know potentially burning it out or what have you, and then you know live with probably very little of any bond control. Or I can put in a resistor in series with the uh, rheostat here and you know probably get a fair amount of volume control and you know current limit drop the voltage down to an acceptable amount and, and kind of do something like uh, Scott did at Scott's crystal radio or I could do uh, a, a shunt where basically the resistor is in parallel with the filament and that will cause more current draw about half the current roughly to go through the resistor and half through the filament and that will get me pretty close to the uh, current draw and voltage drop characteristics of the original WD-11 and then the rheostat will behave more like it originally did of course that draws you know basically twice the current whereas if I did a, a series I, I may not get as much volume control uh, but it you know only use half the power and you know you look at uh, various articles written in the 20s and you know a lot of people pretty early on realizing that using the rheostat to control your volume by the heating of the uh, variable heating of the filament was not a very good approach you know you have to have a certain minimum you know current flowing heat to heat this filament to even get an emission to occur so you're kind of stuck with a kind of a minimum basically and then it's probably not very linear the heating rate is not very you know, proportionate to the volume control or what have you and so that obviously why people went with uh, controlling via the you know the, this, the, uh, the grid screen um, and so you know I could do the first option which I don't think I'll do because it's you know it's just a couple resistors why not just do something second option let's see which one is the second option parallel or something I can't remember which one I was saying just now um, I guess the second option is to do it in series, which certainly seems economical, or I can do it in parallel. And of course I don't have quite the right resistor combination. I'll probably have to do like a, uh, two resistors in parallel, and besides the wattage is too low, I'd need double the wattage for this. Um, and so I think I'll do is I'll probably do the shunt, just looking at um, the uh, antique radio form, the few times that people have talked about doing a uh, 5676 for uh, as a drop-in for a uh, WD-11 looks like uh, most folks are suggesting I think it's around 8 10 ohms I've seen somebody mention like 22 ohms for some reason but I think it's doing the calculations it looks like 8 to 10 ohms would probably be about right and then or I, uh, and then what I'll do is I'll, I'll also try the, the series because it's just kind of tempting to do, go that way because all I have is batteries and uh, it looks like Scott's using an 8 ohm resistor and I think I could probably drop it a little bit further get a little bit more performance out of it as it is you you know you probably do want to you know just like the good old days that you don't want to crank it all the way up up to the highest volume you just burn out the filament the last bit is probably you don't get much of a gain and looking at the um, the data sheets for this uh, 5676 I originally thought it was for hearing aids but it looks like it was uh, actually designed for a push-to-talk walkie-talkie and there they were uh, saying their absolute conditions were uh, one and a quarter volts at um, about an eighth of an amp and you'd only get a hundred hours of uh, use but you know it's a push-to-talk so you know the, the amount of use actually is only while you're pushing uh, the, pushing the talk I would presume so you'd probably get a lot more than that and in the case of for a um, you know detector amplifier here you probably don't need push it that hard so I probably can get away with you know a uh, some sort of current limiting shunt lower volume control here and it probably lasts quite a while and do quite well uh, let's see any other detail here oh, I guess the other thing that was kind of fun is uh, I, I did a, a I found this one a neat um, article from this engineer that had developed it was part of the development of the WD-11 tube so it's contemporary um, article from uh, you know engineering f uh, from um, Westinghouse and he's talking about you know where you put your um, 
current current control resistor and that you do want it on you know this side of the leg not on this side and you'll have odd you know characteristics if you were to put it on the wrong side so you know if you do do a series put it on the rheostat side but what's interesting is he talks about the design of the tube uh, materials how it's the glass is designed vacuum pump down I'll, I'll leave a uh, a link to that uh, that article, that um, paper by this engineer, and he goes into really fun detail like if you have your current set to where the film is just about ready to burn out and you then apply your plate you know voltage current, it, 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 it'll then burn out just like that and that's because you know uh, one side of the filament is hotter than the other side. Most most of your emission is actually coming, from, I guess, from one side, which makes sense. And so if you're really close to those conditions and you then turn on the plate, it'll just push it right over the edge, especially on the side that's the hottest, and bang, your filament goes out. It's kind of fun little details and observations he does of, of the period, which I thought was really kind of neat. So I think what I'll do first is I'll wire it in shunt, and then I'll play around with series. And uh, I think the other thing is I designed the uh, tube originally for a PLA uh, enclosure and uh, my suspicion is that this guy is just not going to get that hot and so I'm, I may also post on Thingiverse a uh, PLA clear version rather than my uh, very challenging copper tube painting job. It's proven to be a lot more work than I would have preferred for something as simple as this. So. Uh, I'll put that also on Thingiverse, and I think that's it. I think that kind of babbles on and covers everything. So I guess I'll solder this guy up. Okay, so I have my uh, little delicate little tube soldered in there with its delicate little uh, uh, little stubby bits of wire that will break off easily. So thus my solder job is probably one of my worst looking solder jobs ever. Not that I'm probably the best solder guy in the world. I have a, uh, a shunt resistor in there of two. 15k ohm resistors, you know, comes out about half that value. That gets me pretty close to what this guy would be uh, if it was the WD11 with its uh, filament value versus what the, uh, the rheostat and the radio need. So I think it'll be a pretty good load and the rheostat will still work correctly. And that kind of goes back to, once again, the research on this guy. Um, really good article here on the internet on various tubes you replaced by. DK owns, and I'll leave a link for that. They do mention uh, passingly the 5676, but they don't really go into any real detail on like a shunt or anything like that, if I recall. They go into quite a few other tube um, possibilities, but uh, you know the WD11 it used about a quarter of an amp at 1.1 volts. The 5676 is. Um, Let's see here, uh, about an eighth of an amp at a little bit higher voltage. So I think this uh, 15 ohms uh, resistor uh, divided by two basically uh, will give me about the right uh, current draw for the filament so that the rheostat will work right. And of course, I don't have to worry about uh, heat dissipation. I'll have uh, probably enough wattage there. So, next thing on the th project is I have the um, copper tube with its uh, little dome in place with some Bondo sanded it and uh, the thing now will be to um, assemble this guy. It is designed to come apart with a screw. The, uh, the uh, 3D printed part is pretty tight so I probably wouldn't even need to do that but in case the socket on the uh, radio is tight I want to be able to pull this guy out without accidentally pulling this um, copper tube off so next thing is to mask this guy off so it stays like uh, bake a light looking black while I silver paint this guy up here and make it look kinda like a silvered uh, glass envelope of the later uh, WD-11s at least from a passing glance it looks somewhat like a vacuum tube and not like um, I don't know what else it would look like yeah, yeah. power of suggestion what that might look like so anyhow um, paint this guy up and see what it looks like. Okay, so it's it's been a few months since I last uh, worked on this, uh, or started working on this project here, and uh, 
you know, I've uh, rearranged my workbench a little bit, got some equipment out that I haven't had before, so this is why suddenly the scene has changed a bit here. Got a oscilloscope from a friend. Only one channel works, but hey, it's quite an improvement over the uh, parallel port um, oscilloscope. And here's the, of course, the object of desire. I now have the WD-11 uh, mock-up uh, tube uh, done with the actual modern little uh, 5676 tube that's embedded inside here. And I have uh, 3D printed some battery packs for this guy, 22 and a half volts of AA batteries. And I'll go into how this is done, so if you want to print your own, you can do so. And then a one and a half volt battery pack of AA's in parallel. And the idea is I just don't have to uh, have, you know, some larger D cell batteries or something like that to provide the filament current. So I think the thing to probably do next is to undo the screws, take the radio out of its box, and kind of just look through it very carefully and just make certain everything's good. And, uh, you know, there's nothing, you know, fatal or disastrous going on there that could cause me troubles. There's so little in this radio that I, I would hope that, you know, everything's good other than, you know, the potential for uh, you know, coils having troubles and so forth. So open this guy up and, and see what's going on in it. Okay, well, let's see if we can do one of this gun here and flip this guy up and see what it looks like. <laughs> I've been waiting quite a while to, to work on this guy. It's really quite uh, quite a special radio as far as I'm concerned. Uh, like I was mentioning earlier, the this is basically your first consumer electronics, so being able to play with this guy and see what it's all about is really kind of neat. Wood uh, screws come out nicely. Oh, the sawdust came out with that one. Wonder if anyone's actually ever been in here. The, the screws do have a little bit of a, a little bit of a nick on them, like maybe you know somebody has, but that could have been just from the original uh, you know assembly. And you look at some uh, pictures of the day of these guys, uh, the, the the production line, and it was pretty hand. They were pretty handmade. And they hadn't, you know, obviously gotten the, you know, volume production um, methods up to speed on these guys. And that's why, proportionally, you look at the cost of videos in the day, they were very expensive for what you got. Okay, so I'm going to very carefully not damaging this box, which is kind of a fragile box. Let's see if I can do this without damaging anybody. Nothing particular on the inside. It's surprisingly clean. As you might expect, it's just a sealed box. Very light wood. wood. And it looks like this one side split a little bit. Hmm. Boy, the, in fact, the, the screw holes are very near the edge. No wonder that they split. They really could have had those pieces of wood a little further back. Well, we'll um, put him carefully off one side. I still gotta find a little rubber foot for this one side. Put him off to one side. Safe location here. Okay, I snagged at this guy just now. Looks like we're good. More light on the subject. And that's that big tube I was expecting to see. I've seen you know a few photos of these, of course, by other folks who had theirs open, so it's really nice to look at this. It's interesting how they did this, you know, they tried to economize as much as possible by using this one tube for everything. You got two variometers in there. Here's I can gauge that everything looks pretty nice. I don't see any indications of distress. And I, I'm guessing that this is a grid leak. It's a, it looks like a giant fuse. I have a capacitor over here. A very early simple capacitor. It's just some plates, some pieces of mica, some wires off of it. And I think this is another capacitor here. Lighting could be a little better today, I think. 
We've got uh, cursory stat. I thought there was a transformer in these guys, but I don't, yeah. I don't see a transformer. I thought that for some reason I thought there was a transformer also in these guys. And you know, it's a wooden box that basically acts as the um, you know the enclosure to mount the uh, the tube, and it looks like it's a little chunk of of uh, bakelite that's on the end, or some sort of phenolic material. And then the uh, the um, ounce for the tube is uh, another piece of like bakelite or something that with some little ring, little strips of uh, brass with some little indents. They almost look like ball bearings. They might be ball bearings. In, uh, held in place or dense, I can't quite tell. And then these little spring straps. Gosh, that's it. Okay. So I guess the next thing is to um, look at... Oh, and then there's a piece of sheet metal here. It's a ground plane for um, um, capacitance effects from the operator. Prevent that from happening. It looks like a zinc plated piece of steel you soldered onto. Everything looks really pristine. I, yeah, I guess there's no transformer in here. Okay, yeah. Thought there was for some reason. Um, everything looks nice. So I guess I'll ohm out everybody and see what we get here. I'm just kind of admiring it. It's just so nice. It's amazing. You know, early. This is your basically earliest consumer electronics. Here it is. <laughs> okay, so let's look at. It. Okay, so looking at this guy so far, I don't see any issues. Uh, it looks like everything's in good order. So, basically this is... Let's see, how can I show this to you folks? I'm getting enough light and everything else. Um, so, we have these two contacts here. Or uh, your uh, high and low RF range. This is the capacitor here. It measures... Uh, Oh, let's see here. Mega ohm range. So it looks pretty good. Goes to this very barometer here. And there's this kind of interesting little split coil here, which is. Let's see here. It was this guy and this guy. So I have a variometer here. This is the variometer for the uh, antenna and then it goes to a little, little length of coil that's on this side and this side and that's represented by this guy and this guy and then this variometer which is part of these two little center coils and of course this rotor is this guy here and ultimately goes through the uh, headphones and the, the main B battery pack and then this capacitor is this guy here this little guy here and he measures uh, in the mega ohms range to um, 300 to infinity something like that the grid leak measures which is this guy here measures uh, uh, um, 1.2 or 3 mega ohms, so a little on the higher side, but not too bad. I think it's within range. I assume that this capacitor is actually built in this guy. Um, I assume that's the, kind of the special thing about grid leaks. And, you know, the uh, rheostat here is about uh, 4 ohms. The coils come out to about four or five ohms each. It seems a lower than I was expecting, but you know, I guess there aren't as many coils. Of, you know, you, you, I usually think of these radios having lots and lots of coils of wire. The total number of turns is only like, you know, 20 turns here, and 20 turns, and maybe 20 turns. So I guess to scale, that doesn't seem like that's uh, that bad. Um, so I don't see any issues. I guess the kind of fun things, I do see some little marks here from somebody's initials when they were working on this guy. I don't know if they will pick up in the light here, but probably not. Um, the circuit all seems to agree with the paper, so I think I'll set this up on... I got a little stand I rigged up here, and I'm going to see if I can put it on this little stand and 
see if I can. Back in the day, I was trying to do some graving work with my CNC. Let's see. This will go. Let's see here. I'll carefully make sure this doesn't cause me any harm. Put you on this guy. Not harming anybody. Because it was sitting, when I think about it, on a shelf. So maybe this, this might not fit as quite as nicely as I thought it would. I don't want to disturb anybody too much. Stress any wires. I was hoping it would, yeah. I may look into this a little bit more and see if I can make a little. I should, uh, I wonder if I should adjust this. Am I stressing anything any by doing this? It looks like it'd be kind of just nice to be able to see it while it works. This one isn't quite long enough. Looks like we're stable and I'm not stressing anybody. So I think we're good as long as, as long as I don't tweak things around too badly. I think, I think that'll work. Think about that for a minute, but uh, yeah, so far it looks it looks like it might work. So I'll hook everything up very carefully here and and uh, see what I get. I guess. But I guess it's stable enough. I'll go with that. Um, I did put a couple screws here, and it seems pretty stable, and I'm not stressing the wires any. So I guess the moment of truth here is for this little, um, you know. Um, WD-11 replacement, see how this guy goes. So I guess the first thing I need to do is plug this guy in. I've never actually tried plugging it in, so let's see if this guy will even, even go into his socket here. Should go in there. Oh, it, goes well. Ooh, it looks, lines up. <laughs> That's pretty good. It actually went in. Okay, pretty smooth. Okay, so the next thing is I have the antenna hookups here. And I have um, the A battery here, one and a half volts, positive. But a minus A B on this side. The 22 volt um, B battery there. Oh, did I say headphones? Those are antennas. Uh, headphones on this side. Okay. And I guess I'll hook up to probably this antenna here for. Of the higher range. I don't know what's below 300 meters. It's, I would think it would be 300, 500 meters would be most everything would be modern. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just kind of do a double check here. I have, uh, you know, the, um, me meter measuring current, meter measuring voltage drop, and I just want to make certain that my simulation basically of you know, tight went to bed. Um, that the simulation here basically is a WD-11 with its quarter amp flow um, comes out about what I would expect the way of a voltage drop across the, the shunt resistor and what the current load would be in, with the uh, rheostat here. And knowing that about half that current's in effect being thrown away by the shunt resistor and about the other half is then actually going to the filament of the WD-11 which needs, not the WD-11, the 5676 which needs about half the current and pretty close to the same voltage though. So I think that's kind of it here so I guess um, let's fire this guy up and see what we get. And when you first start let's see here, I'm already um, close to what would be the current load if, if that was just a, the 5676 I'd be already, I'm already at it but I'm at about half of what would be the current flow for the WD-11 so the other half of that power is going through the uh, that resistor and this is just a, uh, a filament uh, pack. I'm not running the high voltage pack at the moment. So once we get to a quarter of an amp, I hopefully will not exceed my um, one and a quarter volts there. About pushing close to half the uh, rheostat.
Okay, so I'm getting pretty close to what the rheostat would expect. And pretty close to that voltage. So I'm getting kind of close. I'm about uh, a little bit less than the full current. I'm about right about the... Uh, the I, I guess I can go a little bit further in voltage. It's one and a quarter volts, isn't it? Okay, so that's pretty close to about all I can get out of this. So it actually does seem to be using pretty much the full sweep of the, um, the rheostat. So I guess the big next thing is to do is uh, actually hook up an antenna and uh, headphones and uh, see what it uh, see what this guy does. Okay, got everybody all wired up, and I've added a uh, little cheapy amplifier here, it was capacitively coupled, so you can hear it, hopefully, and we'll see what this guy does. You hear a bit of a pop from when the um, high voltage power is applied to the uh, headphones. <laughs> there you go. I'll put the headphones down. All right. That is really cool. Not very differentiating. You can hear a number of different uh, radio stations all at the same time, which is kind of what you know the problem with these early radio sta uh, radios were. Wow, that's working a lot better than I would have thought. Everything's always so simple on the radio, isn't it? Let's see here, there's something there. Can't quite. Uh, several stations overlapping. Can't really get a lot out of the tickler. Well, I mean, that's pretty good considering I'm only at 50%. Now, admittedly, I guess I'm going through the uh, 
amplifier and I can put the headphones on I can hear it really quite well quite a bit better actually it's probably a little clearer the uh, this uh, amplifier does pick up a lot of like I think AC noise but not bad I can looks like I can start to lose that station when I go about to um, I don't know what is this I got this little paper scale on here is it more of a convenience it's about um, 125 de degrees. Then I start to lose it. Hmm. Okay. So I guess the question is, how do I get the tickler to tickle? It doesn't seem to do a lot there. Maybe I can, if I went to a stronger station. Hmm. The tickler does not seem to be particularly obvious. Well, I think it's pretty good. Um, what I might consider doing is um, one, one thing I can't seem to get is the tickler to do much, it seems. <laughs> I'm getting a really good signal. And I'm literally, like I said, through an amplifier here. That's a really strong the signal. Were neither nailed to their crosses nor holding them firmly in their hands, but were their There, you can definitely hear the uh, AC noise from the uh, that this thing's picking up somehow. Well, interesting. It's really, it's really cool. I, very little to get this guy going. It's not very differentiating, as you might imagine, from an early radio like this. I probably get better uh, separation of the stations at night when they dial back their um, their signal strength. And so, what I might do is play with this guy later tonight when that has a uh, lower signal strength. But that's really cool. It looks like little guy works. And yeah, this uh, this AM amplifier picks up quite a bit of noise, AC noise. Interesting. Anyhow, yeah, it's cool. So um, my WD11 replacement uh, 5676 looks like it's working very nicely. Uh, I guess the thing is to kind of explore uh, some various ideas on this guy. Uh, for instance, you know, I'm I'm drawing a lot more power than you would think you'd really need to because um, I'm in effect simulating a uh, WD-11 by having the circuit work just like it more or less would have as far as current draw. The um, the little modern replacement tube is o only needs about half that current. So, and right now in in uh, shunt parallel shunt, uh, what I might consider doing is also exploring it being in series um, and see whether or not I get good enough uh, volume control. And you know, I basically be running my battery pack at about half the current draw so and, and still would uh, wind up with the same result so I might explore that a little bit and kind of see what the frequency response is with the um, maybe the signal generator in so far as how the um, uh, tickler works and so forth it'd be kind of interesting to see because this twiddling the twi tickler right here I, I can't really tell a whole lot I know a lot of these early radios, there'd be a lot of uh, squealing and um, uh, and uh, odd noise coming back through the uh, radio from too much regeneration. And looking at um, the Westinghouse instructions, it looks like if you overdo the tickler, you'll hear kind of a mushy sound, which uh, it's hard to tell with all these stations on top of each other. Um, maybe later tonight I'll, I'll, I'll play it when there's less um, activity going on. 
and maybe I can determine whether whether or not this tickler is actually uh, doing anything. Otherwise, I can play with the signal generator. And maybe I can differentiate something with that. But cool, the guy works. It's really neat. Quite a nice bit of history here. I mean, this is a basically a hundred year old radio, and it just up and runs. Okay, so it's after dark here, and so I think I will uh, see if I get some stations under low uh, signal conditions. Let's see here. Oh, I think it's a. Uh, I guess that's basketball. Well, I must say that it, it, it's better uh, selectivity going on now that the uh, signals are uh, weakened by the uh, night uh, transmission standards. Definitely nice volume control. Oh, and this is uh, this is in shunt uh, parallel, uh, seven and a half ohms resistor in with the filament. Seems to be it. the volume really peaks out, starts to peak out right about there. Noticing from the tickler, it seemed like earlier when I was doing the signal generator, the best results were somewhere around here. It does seem like there's a bit of regen that starts there. I think the best result's right around there. Well, I think if I'm if I do have regen there, it's right around here. So I think I'm getting the most. Definitely gets more loud as you just turn it up. I lost the signal. Well, it seems like if I go past that, I do seem to lose uh, the clarity of the signal. Start knocking some of those down. 37, 37. 
station. Well, at least it looks like at this station, it looks like my best regen, uh, regen area is kind of right through here, and it's highly biased with the volume, and it seems like uh, I'm still the puzzle is where it, it starts getting mushy around here, I guess. Right about there. It seems like as I increase my uh, volume, I'm shifting the regen up maybe a little bit further each time. I think. Or well, maybe not. I don't know. It's very subtle operating the regen. Yeah. Considering this thing's 100 years old, that's a really good reception. Well, I'd say that's a pretty nice radio for 100 years old and a little bit of subtlety on uh, operating the tickler and so forth. And uh, I think I'll put it back in its box. And uh, not sure what else I can do with this guy. It's just an absolutely delight to play with. Okay, so I think that was quite a bit of nice fun with this guy. Let's see if I can put him back in with all the wires still attached. There we go, and we'll put some screws on, back on him and play around with him a bit more, and I think call it good on this guy. It's a really nice radio. Okay, it dawned on me, I uh, probably ought to just take a moment to explain the battery packs that I'll, I'll put the uh, file on Thingiverse for if you folks want to uh, produce some the high voltage packs or low voltage packs and so forth for your, if you ever choose to do so for this project or some other project. It's basically a uh, bunch of electrical contacts that are made out of some really light uh, brass shim stock. Looks like I'm using uh, five thousandths uh, brass. It's just something I bought at the Hobby store many decades ago and cut up in little pieces, bend it to shape, low profile screws to hold it all in place. The uh, low voltage guy is basically the equivalent, same file as the um, high voltage guy, only uh, the uh, little um, a low pocket that forms for where you put the contacts. It ca carries all the way through and you need a another little sheet of uh, sheet metal to go all the way across to um, you know bust them all together in, in parallel. Of course this all works in series and of course they're all labeled with lots of pluses and minuses and so forth. It'd also be a probably good idea to you know put an inline fuse on these guys and uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. It's pretty straightforward. The sheet metal is kind of one of those things you have to tweak and bend them just right to get it right. I was hoping to come up with something a little more sophisticated, but it's just easier just to go with you know sheet metal. You could do springs, I suppose, uh, for but it takes more space. So anyhow, sheet metal, about five thousandths uh, brass, seems to work pretty nicely. Well, I think this is kind of a wrap up for this uh, WD11 replacement for the Westinghouse Areola radio. It works beautifully. I, I really can't say I can take much credit for making it run. It, it just was going to work right out of the box, literally. And uh, the uh, WD11 replacement tube was uh, actually pretty easy. I learned quite a bit about um, things like um, 
filament resistance characteristics and so forth because you know my early uh, thoughts about how to do this project I was a little confused on uh, what dropping resistors or shunt resistors to use because initially I just simply measured the filament resistance of the 5676 and it was only like uh, 2 and 2.6 ohms and really what I needed to have done is looked at the um, data sheet and of course the manufacturer is kind of dialed in what's optimal for that filament when it's hot and that's the thing that uh, kind of threw me off when the filament's hot it comes out about I believe it was 10 and a half ohms so it, if I'd done the, my calculations initially from that it would not have had any confusion because I was thinking what the resistance was at cold but of course uh, the filament as it heats up the resistance goes up and that's kind of useful for things like the dim bulb um, you know, testers and so forth that people do and uh, so anyhow I learned a bit about that filament resistance and so forth and of course uh, techniques on shunt resistance to simulate the the WD-11 closer to um, what it would have been as far as the circuit goes while using a comparatively modern if you want to call a tube in itself is half a century old in itself I think uh, modern um, and it basically behaves pretty much like the WD-11 for all practical purposes in the circuit as far as I can tell I did uh, some further tests with the tickler using the signal generator and oh by the way uh, this is playing through my signal generator uh, MP3 player signal generator piping that in and of course I'm cheating quite a lot with the um, little modern um, transistor amplifier with a capacitively coupled and then I'm going to my homebrew uh, replica headphone adapter speaker horn so fun fun thing to do you can start building up these little these little projects uh, that you can kind of throw together just for the fun of it so where was I thinking on that okay so um, I basically tried uh, several different configurations for the WD-11 uh, resistor uh, methods to make it or I should say the 5676 to make it look like a uh, WD-11 for the radio uh, the shunt obviously is probably the most general practical to use it'll the radio will behave pretty much like as it was a uh, WD-11 higher pack current of course but you know how often are you going to play this thing if you do it in the series configuration for a little bit of economy I found that just with my tests during the daytime the uh, about 8 ohms like uh, Scott did it uh, uh, Scott's crystal radio it worked pretty well uh, of course you have more signal overlap from the different radio stations so it's hard with this really early radio to uh, be selective that was kind of the whole problem with these really early radios and why obviously things were more developed um, at night the 8 ohms is starting to go a little on the too weak side but you can differentiate your signals better so I found in series anyways about a 5 ohm resistor I got more of course of the maximum of the volume control pot a range whereas obviously the 8 ohm I only got mostly the lower range but still, I actually, you know, I have a fair amount of volume control. It's it's not obviously what it would have been originally, but still not too bad. So, you know, if you're worried about battery pack voltage, you could do that. But I think generally, uh, probably just the shunt. Consume double the amount of filament current and just have the radio behave just like it basically would have been. Which is really nice, you know, for $3 and it's just a little bit of 3D printing, I got a radio working with a tube in effect that you just can't buy anymore <laughs> so I'm pretty happy with it so anyhow I think that's kind of all my rattling I uh, hope you enjoyed the video I certainly enjoyed this it's wonderful to have a hundred year old radio that just up and runs no troubles at all and uh, I'll maybe do a restoration someday in the future the radios you know got going anywhere so it's held up this well with the appearance and I think it'll do just fine in the future when I maybe get a little better about restoration work. Uh, I have some nice 3D printed packs and enclosures for a, a fake tube all done up for you know post on Thingiverse and uh, fun project learned quite a bit enjoyed it hope you did too and thank you for watching.